Thank you for coming for the, this webinar. The webinar is going to be about insulin titration and insulin initiation by Dr. Umpires, that is the professor of Emory School of Medicine and the Division of Endocrinology and work here at Grady Hospital. Uh, I, will, I just want to let you know that the webinar for next month is going to be June 19th about management of hypertension in patients with type 2 diabetes. Now we're going to talk about uh, insulin treatment patients with type 2 diabetes. Thank you, Dr. Umpires. <laughs> well, thank you, Lina, and thank you very much to all of you for joining today in this very important webinar. Uh, we have over 100 participants uh, around the country, so it's great. Um, and as Ina uh, mentioned, the next time, mm -hmm. in June 19, we're going to discuss about hypertension, the new guidelines, they are so confusing. Uh, what's the goal, target, and what agents should be, should be used for the management of hypertension. Mm -hmm. So today, we're going to discuss about insulin treatment. And, uh, uh, and I hope that this presentation is very practical. Uh, when do you choose, what to choose, and how are you going to adjust? And of course, there's also, mm -hmm. uh, how do you combine insulin with other agents, especially when glucose control <laughs> is not achieved? Let me start with this, I mean, um, a member of the Professional Practice Recommendation Committee of the ADA, and I chair the Diabetes Council and Guidelines Committee for the American College of Endocrinology. We receive funding for investigating research studies from different companies. Money goes to Emory. Uh, otherwise, I have no direct conflict with any of the pharmaceutical companies. So when you talk about insulin, I think it's good to keep in mind what happened with beta cell function or insulin secretion in patients with type 2 diabetes? And this is data that is derived from the United Kingdom perspective diabetes studies in which you can see is that at the time of diagnosis of diabetes, which you see in the x-axis with the number zero, the, it is estimated that about half of the beta cell function or the capacity to produce insulin is gone in the patient with type 2. And with progression of diabetes, the insulin secretion diminished. And the reason why this happened is because the beta cells of patients with type 2 diabetes undergo apoptosis of cell death more rapidly than a patient without diabetes. So the main reason why people develop type 2 diabetes is the inability of the pancreas to produce enough insulin to overcome the insulin resistance associated with obesity. So when you look at, uh, at the beginning, if you have a patient with type 2 and you diagnose them early, like prediabetes, diabetes in that phase, it's very easy to control them. You are the best doctor in the world, lifestyle will do it, or monotherapy, with monotherapy with metformin that is the prefer, preferred agent. But with increased duration of diabetes, metformin is not enough. Or sulfonylurea, so the agents are not enough. And most of the time we're going to require combination therapy. So when that this combination therapy uh, is needed, well, it varies from patient to patient. But after three to six months that somebody is not well controlled, you should combine agents. And if you look at these slides after age, after 10 to eight to 10 years of, of diabetes, most people are insulinopenic. So we tell our patients that sooner or later, that very likely in the natural history of the disease, they will require insulin. And this is what we have to accept as a fact. And it's not that the patient is not controlled because they don't take care of themselves. It's just the natural history of the disease. So in the last two years, or in the last few years, really, this is the ACE recommendations. You see that the first thing that we recommend is to start oral agents, lifestyle therapy for everybody, and then we go to monotherapy 
and we would like everybody to be treated with metformin because it's as effective as most of the other medicines, it's safe. We have 40, 50 years experience of using as cardiovascular protection. And if metformin is not enough, three months later, we would like you to combine metformin with GLP-1, HGLT-2, DPP-4, or all of the other agents that you see in this slide. The other thing here to your right is when does insulin is needed. So if you have a patient with a couple of oral agents, or more importantly, if you have a patient with symptomatic diabetes, so with polyuria, polydipsia, weight loss, they are catabolic because of the hyperglycemia, you must consider insulin. In patients with type 2 diabetes, we would like you always start metformin in combination with basal insulin. And, it, and, and that's the best way to, to do it. And metformin is important when you start insulin because metformin reduces the need for insulin by about 20 to 30%. So the insulin dose that is required on a daily basis is markedly diminished with metformin. So if I have a patient, for example, that presents to my clinic with glucose of 3, 400, I will start with metformin 500 milligrams twice a day with meals, and I'll give an insulin, a basal insulin, once daily that we will discuss in the next few minutes. When do I use basal bolus? Only for type 1 diabetes or patients who have been admitted with hyperglycemic crisis. But let's review how we start insulin therapy. So these are the recommendations of the American Diabetes Association and the American College of Endocrinologists. As we said before, you start with lifestyle changes plus one or two oral agents, and then you go to basal insulin therapy following that. How much, and here is basal insulin, we would like you to consider analog on top of NPAs However, NPH works well. If you decide to use analogs, the American College of Endocrinology will recommend you to look at the hemoglobin A1C of the patient. If the hemoglobin A1C is less than eight, so if somebody taking one or two oral agents are going to start insulin, you will start on 0.1 to 0.2 units per kilo. So it's somewhere around six to 12, 14 units for most people. And if the hemoglobin A1C is greater than 8%, 8, 9, 10, you start on 0.2 to 0.3 units per kilo. So when do you use the 0.2? Well, elderly people, patients who have some kidney, kidney compromise, and 0.3 for the more obese, younger patient, normal kidney function. So if somebody like me that I'm about 80 kilos, I will start myself on 20 units of insulin once daily in combination of the oral agents. And this is shown in this slide. So rule number one is that you continue the oral agents. Second, you add an even dose of MPH can also be glargin or Deramir or Deglutide. And you start on 0.2 or 0.3 units per kilo. And what you're going to do, you're going to look at the blood glucose next morning, the fasting blood glucose. So if you use MPH, that is very good insulin in patients who are young, normal kidney function, eating well. You're going to start on 0 0.2, 0 0.3, so 20 units or 15 units. And you look at the fasting blood glucose. And you're, then you're going to adjust the insulin daily or every other day or twice a week, increasing the dose of insulin until the fasting blood glucose is within your range. In this case, less than 130, it could be less than 150, you have to decide what the fasting glucose target should be. So why, if you use NPH, you must give it at the evening dose because of the short half-life of the NPH insulin. And what you are, in your mind, what you're doing is to regulate the exaggerated hepatic glucose production that is present overnight in patients with type 2 diabetes. If you are using glargine, or U100, or U300, if you're using Datamir or Deglutec, you can give the insulin dose at any time during the day in a patient with type 2 diabetes. So you give 10, 20 units of insulin at any time, and you talk to the patient and ask, 
what is preferable for each individual. And then you continue the oral agents and you just add the collagen therapy. So when you talk about basal insulin, you have the human insulin, so MPH that have been around since the 1950s. You have the analogs, the lone acting analogs, and you have glargin U300, U100, Vetemir U100, and we have also basoglar or biosimilar that is also U100. And in the last five years, we have the lone acting insulin that is U300, Degludeg U100 or U200. So you have a large number. In reality, we have 12 different formulations of insulin for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. So here this table on the top shows the characteristics of each one of these agents. Human insulin starts working in two to four hours. It peaks in about four to 10. It varies from patient to patient. Then it has a duration of action between 12 to 16 hours. Deramir and Glargin are very similar. Glargin has a little longer duration of action, but not much different. And in contrast to the NPH, it doesn't have a pronounced peak. And this is shown in the bottom on the different graph that we see in this slide. And this is the NPH. The problem with NPH that has a peak, but it works well. And, but the variability of day to day is much larger than Deramir shown in the middle or the glargin shown in the right lower quadrant of this slide. So how good is NPH? NPH works very well. And we have used NPH in combination with metformin for the last 40 years. It has also been shown in combination with sulfonylurea, although the risk of hypoglycemia is higher if you use NPH and sulfonylurea. What you see in these slides is data from Europe, from all data 20 years ago. That is, if you have a patient take a bedtime MPH with oral agents, and you see that the reduction with metformin and MPH is somewhere around 2 to 2.5 percent. Even MPH at bedtime, MPH twice a day, so it works very well. You start 15, 20 units of MPH, continue metformin, and it works very well. In the last few years, in the last 12 years, we have the data from Glargin, U100, and Deramir. And if you compare MPH, what is shown here to the left, versus Glargin, there is no difference in glycemic control. So if you titrate NPH at bedtime or Glargin at bedtime or any time during the day, and you increase the dose progressively to achieve good glucose control, there is no difference. So the efficacy of NPH and glargin is very similar. And the same thing, it could be compared to Deramir in the right side of this slide. But if you compare the safety, so the hypoglycemia risk between NPH and glargin, or NPH and Deramir shown to the left, glargin shown to the right, and if you try to achieve a fasting blood glucose less than 100, less than 110, you have more hypoglycemia. So if you are going to use NPH, you should not try to get, you should not target a fasting blood glucose less than 100, 110, 120. I target a blood glucose, fasting blood glucose less than 140. In that case, I don't get much hypoglycemia. But if you use the analogs, you can titrate through a lower blood glucose in the way that you have less hypoglycemia. So again, this is how you start NPH in the evening, glargin at any time during the day, you start at 0.1 to 0.2 or 0.2, 0.3, depends on hemoglobin A1C. But if you start, let's say 15, 20 units for a patient with type two, that's likely is not enough. But you want to start at a low dose because you want to prevent hypoglycemia. If you start in the higher dose and the patients start with uh, develop hypoglycemia, they get scared. And we know that patients who have recurrent hypoglycemia, they don't titrate and they lose control. So what we want is to start low dose and ask the patient to self-adjust the insulin. So we tell the patient to increase the insulin dose by two to four units every three to five days. 
and the patient can do that themselves. And you have to teach them. I write in a piece of paper, if blood glucose greater than 150, 180 every day, you increase by 12, two units. So I tell you, you start on 20, you go to 22, 24, 26, every three to five days until you achieve goals. There are some other ways to do it. You can increase by 10% if the blood glucose between 140 to 180, or by 20% the total glucose, the total insulin dose if the fasting blood glucose greater than 180. It doesn't matter what formula you use, the patient should learn how to adjust insulin therapy. <clears throat> and of course, if you start 10 to 20 units, it's not enough. For ex and, and this has been shown in different studies, like this one that depicts uh, the amount of insulin in different studies, uh, the in total insulin dose is somewhere around 40 to 80 units for most people. So if you start on just 10, 20 units, they need to self-adjust. And this is important because in most of the clinical studies, for example, this is a meta-analysis in almost 17,500 patients. The chances that somebody using oral agents and added basal insulin is it's not very good. Most people do not achieve good glycemic control, only 50%. So this is important to keep in mind. And you have to tell the patients, because the patients are expecting that if you start insulin, they're going to be in control. But unfortunately, not everybody achieves control. So you need to titrate the dose up. And of course, keep in mind, and the patients should keep in mind, that maybe this is not enough and you need to have combination therapy. So why is not enough? Because basal insulin control the blood glucose during the night, during the fasting stage, and before meals, but it doesn't cover the postprandial glucose excursion. So if I have somebody taking metformin, esophenylurea, or metformin, and you add insulin, I'm going to control the basal, I'm going to control the pre-meals, I'm going to control the overnight blood glucose, but it's not going to control the postprandial glucose excursion. And what is shown in these slides is that the higher the hemoglobin A1C, the higher the peaks after, after meals. So if you have somebody on basal insulin not enough, you have to control postprandial. And how can you control postprandial? Well, you can do it with insulin or with other agents. So you can change the patient to pre-mix insulin, or you can add basal plus or basal bolus, so multiple doses of insulin, a combination of basal and rapid acting insulin. Or more importantly, what we do right now is combine the insulin with other agents. So this is the Emory algorithm that we tell our patients how to manage patients with premix. So we start 70-30 insulin. Remember this is, can be analog or it can be human insulin. A human insulin is just $25 a month. A analogs are much more expensive. And if somebody you're going to start on 70-30, if the patient is symptomatic, we start on 0.2 to 0.3 units per kilo. And we divide, we give two-thirds of the dose in the morning, one-third in the evening. So if I'm going to start somebody on 30 units of insulin, and we start 20 units in the morning, 10 units in the evening, and then we're going to ask the patient to adjust the insulin every by two units in the morning and at night, every two to three days. And more importantly, I'm going to continue the oral agents in most of these patients. So how good is 70-30 compared to Glargen or with Theramir? Here to the left, this is a study on 371 patients with type 2 diabetes on a combination of oral agents, and you add a premix or Glargen, you see that the glucose control is very similar. Insulin is insulin and bring the blood glucose down. But to the right is the rate of hypoglycemia. And you have more hypoglycemia with 70-30 compared to glargin if you titrate to a blood glucose less than 100, 110. This is another study from Phil Raskin in Dallas. And it also shows that they have more hypoglycemia with premixed insulin compared to glargin. However, there are other studies more recently that shows 
if you don't titrate that aggressively, the difference is not much different. So you can also do low actin, a combination of low actin and prandial insulin, so what we call basal bolus approach. So the rapid acting insulin, so the Lispro, the aspirate, glue, lysine, is given before meals. They peak quite rapidly in about 20 to 30 minutes and prevent the glucose excursion after a meal. And you give the basal insulin once daily. So in the past, we asked the patients in basal bolus, most of the time what we would like to do is what is called do a step transition from basal to basal plus one, plus two, plus three. That means that you give basal insulin the same dose and you add five to 10 units of insulin before the largest meal. If that's not enough, you go to the second largest meal. If that's not enough, you go to the full blown basal bolus approach given basal insulin plus rapid active insulin before each meal. And this is what the uh, American College of Endocrinology recommend. You start the basal plus one, plus two, plus three, and you start on five units or 10% of the basal dose <laughs> given before each meal, and you progress to have 50% basal, 50% prandial insulin. And there's a large number of studies that have shown that glucose control is very similar if you do from basal balls or you progress from basal one, plus one, plus two, plus three. So how good is basal bolus? Basal bolus is excellent in the way that you will increase the chances that somebody will go from basal, only 50% achieve goal. If you go to basal bolus, about two thirds or three fourths of the patient will achieve goal. Not everybody, not everybody, but basal bolus is much better but it has some inconvenience, that's right. The inconvenience is going to be multiple injections of insulin per day, and patients don't like that. Second, weight gain in the way that insulin tries to gain weight. It tends to, patients in insulin gain, gain weight, so somewhere around two to three kilograms in average. And there's the risk of hypoglycemia. So this is what we have had until very recently. The analog derimere of glargin or the human insulin of analog premix. In the last few years, we have this lone actin insulin. Let me quickly review them for you. So we have glargin U300, and we have deglutec U100 and U200. They have a very long half-life of about 24 hours for glargin, and about 40 hours, uh, 40 hours, uh, 36 hours for large and about 40 hours for deglutin. And what is happening is that a steady state is achieved later, but the peak is very flat. So it's very good in the way that it gives you, it's easier to take the insulin. If you don't take it at eight, you can take it at 12, midnight, or even the next morning with good control. So large U300, it, it has long half-life, duration of action about 36 hours. And here you have compared to, to insulin glargin U100, in blue is U300, the effect is very flat, much flat, flatter than patient with U100 insulin therapy. So there are several studies in type one and type two diabetes and if you compare the efficacy, so the ability to reduce insulin, the hemoglobin A1C between glargin U100 and glargin U300, there is no difference. But the rate of hypoglycemia is much less with glargin U300 compared to U100 insulin. There are several studies in patients with type 2 diabetes and in patients with type 2 diabetes, um, and all of them have shown that the efficacy in reducing hemoglobin A1C is very similar to the U100. And in most series, you decrease the hemoglobin A1C between 0.8 to 1.5 milligrams. So if you want to change U100 to U300 to improve glycemic control, wrong. You won't get that 
that what is shown in these slides is that several studies have indicated that U300, because of the flat effects, the long duration of action, the rate of hypoglycemia is reduced by about 15 to 30 percent especially in nocturnal hypoglycemia. So the reason why you will choose U300 instead of U100 is because of the reduction in hypoglycemia. It comes also only in pens. We don't have it in syringes. Uh, and if you want to change one somebody from U100 to U300, you do one-to-one -one dose conversion. So you don't need to change the dose, just change the device. So what about insulin deglutin? That's the new insulin, a newer insulin, who has a duration of action, as I mentioned before, about 40 hours, half-life with 24, 25 hours. And you can detect insulin up to five days after injection. And the effect is very flat. As shown in this slide, this is the glucose lowering effects. And you see that doses of 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, it doesn't change. So it doesn't have the peak that we see with Datamir and we see with Clarge. So again, if you want to change U100 or even MPS to Degludate, you don't do it because of you want improved glycemic control. The effect is the same as shown in these slides in the right upper quadrant, in the left upper quadrant, that is uh, showing that is equal the reduction in hemoglobin A1C. Yeah, you titrate the dose until hemoglobin A1C comes down. But what is shown here on the right is the rate of hypoglycemia. And Degludec has been shown to significantly reduce hypoglycemia compared to all of the other insulin, including U100 insulin therapy. It comes in two concentrations. In U100, so 100 units per ml, or U200, 200 units per ml. So good. In the U100, you can deliver up to 80 units per injection, the other up to 160 units per injection. The price is very similar. And if you compare U100 with Degludec, Degludec has significant less hypoglycemia as shown in this DEVOTE trial published about a couple of years ago. Uh, that it shows that you reduce hypoglycemia and it would be the same for NPH, that's right. So glargin is better than NPH in reduction of, uh, of hypoglycemia. Degludec has less hypoglycemia compared to U100. And if you compare U100, uh, U300 and Degludec, there is no difference in the effects on the hypoglycemia. So, should we use, what insulin should we use? One of the major problems that we have, especially in, in, in many areas, and I work at Grady Hospital with 32% of my patients have no insurance. So what about cost? Cost is an important factor as shown in this slide. The cost of insulin has increased significantly during the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, but there are insulin, especially the human insulin, the regular, the NPH, the pre-mixed uh, insulin, 70-30 uh, with NPH 70%, regular 30%, that you can get it by $25 at Walmart and in some pharmacies. So human insulin is still relatively cheap. But if you look at the cost of analogs, the cost is somewhere well over two and 300 and in many, in many areas, it's even much higher. So this is something that I, I use. I, I use a lot of 70-30 or MPH at bedtime or 70-30 twice daily in many patients. And I start on 0 0.2, 0 0.3 units, and I divide and I progress if the patient has no insurance. So uh, the good thing about basal bolus is that they achieve control but it has multiple injections. So what do you do if the patient after basal insulin is not well controlled? Again, just to remind you that it's because of the postprandial glucose excursion. So you need to cover postprandial. And the way to cover postprandial 
is given multiple injections a day. Or the other thing is to combine basal insulin with a GLP-1 receptor agonist, a DPP-4, or an SGLT-2 inhibitor. All these three ways, um, or three regimens, are effective in controlling postprandial glucose excursion. So the first one is GLP-1. This is my favorite. There are right now studies comparing going from basal to basal bolus, from basal plus one GLP-1 daily or every week, and the glucose control is exactly the same. So why is that? Because GLP-1 works in multiple ways. It increases insulin secretion. Second, it reduces glucagon secretion, so decreases glycogenolysis or exaggerated hepatic glucose production. It slows down gastric emptying, so your sugar, your, your, your glucose excursion after a meal is delayed. And of course, it's associated with decreased appetite because of the central effect of the GLP-1 in the brain. So the combination of basal and GLP-1 is very attractive. GLP-1 has been shown to improve hemoglobin A1C and the left, decrease body weight, and markedly decrease the insulin dose because your glucose is better and you have a delay in gastric emptying. It can be given once a day, it can be given once a week. And there are several once daily. Uh, Liraglutide is the most commonly used daily GLP-1, but there are several once weekly medications. And we have a exenatine once weekly, a dulaglutide or trulicity once weekly, and we have semaglutide once weekly. So you give the basal every day and once a week GLP-1. This study shows the combination of glargin with placebo or glargin with exenatides in yellow. And you see that the addition of exenatide markedly improved glycemic control by 2% without the weight gain that we see with basal polytherapy. So the combination of basal and GLP-1 is really great. This is another study that is called Lixlan O, in which patients were receiving oral agents and with the randomized to receive glargin in blue, Lixi sanitize a GLP-1 in orange, and the glargin Lixi in black. And this is the only way that you can achieve glycemic control with hemoglobin A1C less than 7%. Here you have that starting with the hemoglobin we see about 8.2 percent, the end of the treatment at 30 weeks, 26 weeks, the hemoglobin A1C was reduced at 6.5 without an increased risk of hypoglycemia. The other thing is that we discussed in previous meetings is that the GLP-1 has been shown to be cardioprotective. And for example, this is the use of liraglutide in the LEADER trial that added two oral agents and added two medications for diabetes. It reduced the maze outcome that included cardiovascular death, non-fatal myocardial infarction, or stroke. So, and this is another study with semaglutide that also reduced cardiovascular events. So the combination of basal insulin with GLP-1 is, a, is the preferred way to manage patients instead of going to basal bolus therapy. So basal bolus, primary care use love basal bolus. Endocrinologists do not. For patients with type two, a different story is patients with type one. So basal bolus has great efficacy. Most people achieve goals, about two thirds of them, and we're used to do it. But basal plus GLP-1 have similar efficacy, have less injection than the three shots, four shots a day, they have lower risk of hypoglycemia, no weight gain, and may have cardiovascular risk reduction. So cons or, or adverse experience, basal bolus have hypoglycemia, weight gain, cardiovascular neutral, uh, 
the GLP-1, of course, has the main problem that I have is that GI adverse events, about 30% develop nausea during the first couple of weeks, and cost. Cost is always a big time consideration. So what about DPP-4 and HGLT-2? How well do they cover postprandial glucose escorsion? And here you have data for the use of DPP-4. The DPP-4 works mainly in the postprandial state. So if you keep basal with DPP-4, you're going to decrease the glucose excursion after a meal. And that's why you reduce hemoglobin A1C and it's weight neutral and cardiovascular neutral. So there are several studies combining SGLT, uh, DPP-4 and insulin, and I use it a lot, especially in elderly people with the hemoglobin A1C less than 8%, they're not a goal, I may add a DPP-4. You can also try the SGLT2. SGLT2 works by flushing glucose in the urine and flushing sodium in the urine, has cardiovascular protection, but also cover postprandial. And here you have the effects, the combination of SGLT2 plus basal insulin, you get a great effect on somewhere around 0.8 to 1.5%. And more importantly, with no increased risk of hypoglycemia. So, excellent medications to be used in patients with insulin. So, in this slide, I was, uh, this is my bias, and I think represent where the American College of Endocrinology and the American Diabetes Association will suggest how, what to do. So you start life changes, you add metformin, you combine oral agents, and then you add basal insulin. And in the past, we went to basal insulin to basal bolus. There's no question that right now, any time that I see a patient with type 2 after basal insulin, I will go to basal plus GLP-1 or DPP-4 and SGLT-2 because these agents do not produce weight gain and may be cardioprotective. I hope that this lecture has been practical and helped you to manage patients with diabetes. So things to keep in mind are, one, diabetes is a progressive disease characterized by diminishing beta cell function due to beta cell apoptosis with decreased beta cells who are the cells that make insulin in the pancreas. So you start with one, two pills, three pills, and at the end, you must consider insulin therapy if the hemoglobin A1C is not at goal. Basal insulin is what we recommend. And it can be NPH at nighttime and in the evening, or one of the analogs at any time during the day. You can also use 70-30 or pre-mixed insulin in most of the patients. You start with 0 0.2, 0 0.3 units per kilo, and you titrate up because the use of those is much more than the 0 0.2, 0 0.3 kilos that a patient would require. If basal insulin is not enough, you might add insulin increasing agents. You can go to basal bolus, multiple injections a day. Well, I will call you to think that maybe the insulin plus GLP-1 or DPP-4 may be better in most people, the same that SGLT2 may be better than the use of a basal ball therapy. Now, keep in mind one thing, that most people, most people will, will need insulin sooner or later in, during the lifetime of a patient with diabetes. Patient who has symptomatic diabetes should be on insulin therapy. That doesn't mean, and always combine with metformin uh, if you're going to start basal insulin or basal bolus insulin because that reduces the insulin requirement during the day. I appreciate your attention. Um, you can get credit and you can download these slides from, from the website.